following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. So our lecture today is um, in regards to our psychological work that we are uh, often speaking about in many different lectures, throughout many different books that we read. We mention a psychological work. In our previous lecture related to psychoanalysis, we spoke a little bit about this, but in our our lecture today, we want to take more of a comprehensive look of how to put all these different pieces together. We often speak about different parts of this work and that we need to meditate and we need to observe ourselves, but how, do we, how, how does it all come together into something that transforms us? How do we achieve that? How can we look at it as a method, as a system? In my understanding, there is a method. It is not something haphazard or something accidental. Our being, our innermost, our inner God, is the one that's organizing the work, organizing our work, organizing our karma. But we have our role to play, and our duty is to take advantage of that situation which is presented before us. So we have to do our part. We have to work in a way that has a discipline. That discipline needs to be both rigorous and exacting and also fluid and dynamic. There's different ways that we have to work, but we have to be consistent. We want to eliminate our ego. We want to transform. We want to um, achieve liberation. But we can't simply pray and beg to, to God to change ourselves, to change our situation. We can if we wish, but there's laws, there's karma. We have to pay that karma. We have to work with it in some way. We cannot just simply have a hope or have a desire to change ourselves. So there has to be some type of method. And there has to be some type of, of discipline. So in the Revolution of the Dialectic, it's written, by having super discipline, we will comprehend and accept that we have to take life willingly as a gymnasium. Whosoever submits himself to super discipline can expect great triumphs. Those who live by super discipline will have to be strong in order to bear the solitude of the path. So I bring this up because it, as we approach this doctrine, as we, be, as we begin to study, as we become acquainted with the doctrine, we learn in, at different levels in different ways, and we begin to just use the techniques. And this is helpful. But at some point, we need to organize everything because to just work in a haphazard way would lead to haphazard results. It would be more accidental. There might be sometimes 
by just um, living and trying to, to see defects, you might be able to comprehend some level. But if you're not putting it through a method and you find yourself stagnant, then where do you know where you may have gone wrong? How, how do you know if you're, you're working correctly or not? So, in the beginning, if we're looking to um, change ourselves, the first thing we need to understand is what is it that we are changing? And why do we want to change? So, we speak about the ego and we speak about the essence. Right? We have the personality as well. We have, different, we have different parts of the being or spirit. But when we have the, the psychological work, we're usually pointing towards working with the ego. So what is, what is that? Why, is it, why do we have that and why does it need to change? So the ego is something that doesn't have a true root of existence. What does instead is what we can call the essence or the consciousness or the soul. This is an exponent of our being. This is the part of ourselves which is our connection to our innermost, to our inner father and mother, which connects us to the absolute, which is the source of where we have departed from. So it's the essence that is what we are trying to develop. But unfortunately, we have the ego. Originally, the essence is placed into a lot of experiences. We call this the wheel of evolution and devolution, the transmigration through different kingdoms. And we arrive in this, this physical body, but we develop the ego. And partly, this ego is necessary, because without it, the essence is virginal. It's, it's um, naive. And it's not knowing the difference between good and evil. It's through our comprehension of the ego that we learn what is good and what is bad. Because the ego is related to our karma, it's related to our actions. So we develop the ego. And in a certain, to a certain respect, it's, it's necessary. Because we need to learn from mistakes. We need to learn how to manage energy. And through the consequences of mismanaging energy, you develop ego. And that ego is a condensation of energy that, that surrounds and traps our essence. But not just as one thing, but as many different things. So this is why we call the ego as being multiple, a legion. So this is where we get the word aggregate from. We say that the I is many because the ego is a certain type of condensation of energy that is wrapping up parts of our essence and developing its own self-will, which we call desire. So the, the essence is the root of our willpower, and it's the root, or I should say it's our connection to our willpower. It's our connection to our perception. Our, our pure perception, our pure willpower. But the ego modifies that. It modifies our perception. It modifies our willpower. So instead of seeing things as they are, we see things in accordance with how our ego has modified it. So if you take a, if you take a source of light and you put a lens in front of it that distorts that light, you see something different. Obviously, right? So, when we talk about observing ourselves, we are activating our consciousness in order to look, in order to see. Because although we have an ego, we also still have some amount of free consciousness. A little bit. Typically, we say we have 97% of our consciousness within an ego, within egos, within aggregates. And a small percentage, 3%, is able to 
be free of that and be able to see and perceive and act freely. So we can take advantage of that. If, by taking advantage of that, we can look and see and look into ourselves using that, that, that part of ourselves which has that free consciousness. And this is the first step. Now, sometimes people hear that we have the 3% free consciousness and the 97% that's trapped in the ego. But what we have to further understand is that we have to activate the 3% that's free. If we don't activate the 3%, then we're, we're not actually, we're not uh, using it. So how do we activate it? We have to use our willpower. We have to be present. We have to place our attention inside that free consciousness in order to observe all of the different diverse interactions of all the different things that are going on inside of ourself. So we need to remove the ego in order to liberate our consciousness. We need to remove the ego in order to gain self-knowledge, in order to become a being knowing good and evil and transcending good and evil. So, the first step we can say is discovery or simply observation. In the Great Rebellion, it, it is written, in everyday life, it is advisable to observe oneself with the purpose of self-discovery. It is precisely everyday life, the psychological gymnasium, through which we can discover our defects. In a state of alert perception, watchful attention, we can directly verify that the hidden defects flare up spontaneously. Clearly, we must work on the discovered defect consciously with the purpose of separating it from our psyche. Above all, we must not identify with any I defect if we really want to eliminate it. So if we don't observe ourselves, if we don't observe life, then we remain ignorant to what is going on inside of ourselves. We remain ignorant of our own self. We lack self-knowledge. We lack gnosis. <clears throat> so we have to observe it. But how do we pull something out of our unconsciousness? Because the ego itself is something unconscious. Now we've talked about in other lectures that the consciousness can awaken in two ways, outside of the ego or inside of the ego. But normally, m most of us have our consciousness sleeping inside of the ego. Those who awaken within the ego are working very hard to concentrate their desire and they wake, awaken inside the ego. So typically, what we want to remove is not, is not in our conscious perception. It's in our subconscious perception, our unconscious perception, or what we can call our infraconsciousness as well. So how do we discover our ego? And this is what is written, is that in a state of alert perception, we can directly verify that the hidden defects flare up spontaneously. So by observing ourselves, by observing our mind, we, we simply observe it for that defect to come up. We don't know what it might be. We have to, we have to sit or be in that perception, that watchful attention, waiting for something to appear. In the same way that an animal who is trying to hunt is sitting prone, very watchful, right for the correct moment in order to grab that um, element being that's being hunted. So we sit and watch. So we have to develop a capacity of self-observation. How do we do that? Because it is a skill that we need to learn how to develop. It's, it's a skill that we learn through practicing. So self-observation is something we should 
be taking up all the time. It should be our default. It should be our present way of being at, at, at all times. To be, for example, an awakened person, an awakened man or an awakened woman, is that, is to be present, to be observant, and to remember oneself amongst all the different diverse manifestations of impressions that are coming about outside of yourself and never falling into identification and never falling into fascination and never falling into dreams and never falling into willpower that's trapped in desire. That's what it means to be awakened. So we have that, that little bit of free consciousness, but we need to learn how to activate it. We need to learn how to be observant. And, ha and it has a lot to do with with um, dividing your attention or, or checking in with yourself and relaxing. So moment by moment, whenever we can remember, we, take a, we, we, we look into ourselves. Just, just by doing that, you're already taking a step towards observing yourself. You have to continuously remind yourself to observe yourself. And there's different ways. We, we speak about the, the key of soul, S-O-L which is one of the basic ways of, of structuring your self-observation. So SOL is a reference to the sun. So you can think of the key of the sun in terms of, of Christ. But SOL means subject, object, location. SOL. So if you walk into a room, for example, we can say it this way. Every time you walk into a new place, every time you arrive at a, a new place, remember S-O-L. You ask yourself a couple questions. First subject, who am I? What am I? I am here. You can divide your subject into intellect, emotions, and behaviors, and instincts. The three brains. So you think subject, okay, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What am I doing? What are my impulses? Right? So you, you just check in. Even if, it's a, even if this is just you know, having a, a short dialogue in your head, that's, that's, a, that's where you start. Just to remind yourself. I'm in this room. I got, you know, I'm, I'm feeling sort of neutral. You may not always have a powerful emotion. And you might feel agitated. You might feel tired. You might... You might Realize at that moment, because you checked in with your, with your motor brain, that you're clenching your fists, or that you're, you know, you're clenching your, your eyebrows, or, or your teeth, or there's some anxiety somewhere. So you're immediately, you've observed that. That's observation. That is noticing that there's something going on. If, if, if you're not relaxed, then why are you tense? Where's the tension coming from? you immediately have a, a little marker or a little uh, flag that's saying, you're tense for a reason. You may not know why, you might not realize why, or you, you, you may. You may know that you're thinking about something that you're anxious about. But you're, you've brought that into your attention. If you, didn't, if you didn't go through that exercise, you would have continued to be tense. And if you continue to be tense, you're having unconscious mental activity. And if you're having unconscious mental activity, you're living in ignorance. So you're bringing that activity into your consciousness, into your observation. You might realize, oh, well, I'm tense because of something that's going on at work, some deadline, or because that, you know, we had a, somebody had an argument yesterday. It doesn't, it's not a profound, you know, the clouds don't open up and the, a giant thundering voice you know, says that you now have gnosis or something like that. This is, it, it arrives in its, in, its, in its stage that you have to observe what's going on right now with your mind. Because all of these little things build up into who you are as a person. So going back to SOL, right? So the first is subject. And you can divide that into the three brains. Then it's object. So what is the object? Object can be anything that you're dealing with, anything that's kind of in front of you right now. So if you are 
holding your iPhone, that might be the object. If you're making a cup of tea, or there's something right there in front of you, right? What are you? What? What are you? What are? What are your senses uh, focused in on? That's the object. Again, you do a, you do a reality check. Is this making sense? What is? My, what am I doing here? Sometimes when you do SOL and you're eating food, the the object becomes the food you're eating, and you will notice how gluttonous you are right now. You'll notice how much your gluttony is activated because you're, you're, not, you're consuming this food in a very gluttonous way that you may not have realized before. I just thought it was very tasty. But if you take a moment to reflect on it, you can see how you, you're kind of just engorging yourself. So, that, so this is, like I said, this is a way of checking in and it's, a, it's like a, a bookmark or a way of kind of getting right at What's this present moment? What is this defect that spontaneously appears? Well, sometimes you just have to observe it, and, and it's right there. And then location, which is the L of SOL. You observe, where am I right now? And we have to continuously adopt a, an attitude of curiosity, especially with location, because we tend to inhabit this familiar locations over and over again, but we stop looking at them. We stop observing them. And life tends to become boring when you stop looking at and being curious and looking for the newness in life. So location is very helpful because you, you, ha you see things in a novel way it awakens your consciousness when you see things in a novel way. Particularly if you, are, if you make, make sense of how you got into your location currently. Because if you can think back and say, I'm in this location because I walked here and I drove there and this all makes sense. If you do that spontaneously throughout the day, eventually you'll do it when you dream. And you'll, you'll discover that the location that you're in doesn't make sense because you, you, you will remember that you went to sleep. So this, the SOL is a way of, of dividing our attention, and it's a way of waking up our consciousness. Because everything makes sense here. So if you don't do that, then you just kind of, it's, it's quite amazing how we can think we're kind of aware and kind of awake, but we're just accepting all these impressions. You can see if you have a dream and something very strange happens, and you just accept that strangeness in the dream like, like it's any old regular thing because the consciousness is sleeping. Even if you're remembering the dream. At that time, in the dream, you didn't check in with yourself. You didn't really awaken your consciousness. You didn't activate anything. So you just accepted this really bizarre event. If you were to take advantage of that, if you were to... to Kind, if you were to practice SOL repeatedly, it starts to get ingrained at a more mechanical level. And you start to automatically do it throughout the day and you start to do it throughout the night. Because whatever you do during the day, you repeat in your dreams. And this is a way to awaken. So that is one way to divide our attention and, and to discover ourselves. But as we're moving on, as we're moving through life, we have to continue to self-observe. So if you catch yourself, you're, you're, you're not conscious, you might do SOL to, to wake yourself up. But then you have to continue to observe yourself. Continue to move through, through self-observation. And the two primary factors of self-observation are what's going on in the outside world and what's going on in the, the inner world and how the two relate to each other. Because it's through that relationship that things pop out of the mind. So, for example, if you are going for a walk, or if, you're just, if you're, you park your car and you have to walk across a parking lot to get to work or to get to a building or something like that, you're by yourself, you're walking. Wonderful place to observe yourself because there's, very, there's not that many um, you're not talking to someone else. It's not as complicated. So you're just kind of walking. You can learn to relax your body and walk and observe your mind and observe the world. 
It's more difficult to observe yourself as you are having a conversation or in a social gathering. There's a lot more going on there. We still want to do that. We still need to do that. But to begin how to learn how to self-observe yourself, I've always found it helpful or easier in those moments when you're by yourself. Maybe you're in the world, there's still things going on, but you're in this, this time when you're just walking, maybe. Or maybe just sitting down. So you observe yourself. You can observe your, the senses. What am I seeing? What am I hearing? You can open up your consciousness to the, the different birds that are singing or different noises. You're seeing different people. And because you're being observant, you begin to notice how you are responding to the way everybody is appearing to you. And I, for example, in a previous lecture I mentioned about when, when you see someone, you immediately bring up a whole host of, of factors that come up in, inside of you and you immediately judge that person. And maybe even an accurate judgment. It may even be like, that's a person I, I don't want to be next to that person. It looks like they're, they're pretty dangerous or something like that. But it's not a judgment like condemning a person or something like that, but it's just an accurate perception. But beyond that, just the way you respond to the what, what the world is giving you. You have to become curious as to why do I feel repulsed, or not even repulsed, but a slight, a slight tension between this person and a, and a slight maybe attraction towards this person. You have to become curious about that. You may, you may realize it's happening, but you have to become curious because that's telling you about yourself. You may think, it's telling me about the other person. I like that person. I don't like that person. But a, a more, a, a more um, integral or deeper way of looking at that is really telling you about yourself. It's giving you a way to look into your unconsciousness because if that judgment or if that, if, if that impression, the quality of that impression and how you relate to that impression is good or bad or indifferent, you found out something about yourself. You have to question that. You have to look into it and not just accept it because something about you automatically placed it there. Your unconscious will or unconscious perception put it there. So if you approach that with curiosity, you can look into it. If you just accept it, then you, you, begin, you, you never really realize why you're making the decisions that you're making. It all starts with these little, these little things. So self-observation is, is, our is a part of our discipline that we, we, we have to practice continually and continue to remember to do it throughout the day. And like I said, there are more difficult times to practice self-observation. That would be when you have a lot more impressions coming in, out at you very quickly. Sometimes in, in social situations. You know, how quickly can we go from having an equilibrated three brains and then jump into a conversation of two or three people and instantly become fascinated, instantly forget ourselves, instantly start to gossip and slander or become you know, emotionally entangled in some concept or, or some desire, right? The attraction is so quick and so powerful. We lose our our observation. So we have to struggle to be observant, but we also need to reflect and observe how we lose, how we lose our, our self-remembering, how we lose our self. Because that, again, is giving us the clue that that impression made me fascinated. Therefore, there's an ego related to that type of impression that made me fascinated. So if we were to break down this a little bit, you have the outside world, which is, which we get through the sense impressions. We get through our eyes and our ears and our nose and touch and our tongue. That's how we get this external world. The reason we get, for example, an image is because light from somewhere else bounced off that image, interacted with that thing that creates the image, and then that light, after interacting with that thing, comes into our eyes 
and interacts with our eyes. And then our eyes trans transform and transmit that data into our mind. And then our mind, our ego, interacts with that information. So there's all these different interactions. Then that interaction in our, in, in our mind, right? So you have the outside world coming into our mind, interacts with our mind. And that's where we get this pull to possibly become fascinated and identified with, with a moment. Something about that, the quality of the interaction pulls our ego into activity. So if we're self-observant and the ego is unconscious, how is it that the ego or unconscious activity, we forget ourselves, takes, takes control of the three brains and our consciousness it becomes late, um, goes to sleep. Now, how does that happen? If we are in control, then the ego comes and takes over control. Why is that happening? It's because the quality of that impression is, attracts the quality of our mind, which is in an egotistical state. Which is the, which, so our ego is attracted to certain impressions. In the same way that a magnet attracts the filings of, of um, iron. If you, were to, if you were to make a bunch of iron filings on a table and you put a magnet there, the magnet would attract them all. So the magnet is like the impressions. And all those different iron filings are like our aggregates. And they all clump together and, and form a shape in response to that magnet. Now, if you could imagine a million different types of magnets and a million different types of ways that those iron filings could aggregate and clump into different shapes, you might have a, a way of understanding the way the ego is shaping itself in response to the impressions. Because the ego has its own self-will. So it acts in accordance to its own self-will. Our consciousness when it's active and we're self-remembering, is doing the will of our innermost, of our Father. But the ego takes the capacity to have willpower and imagination, but because of this aggregation of, of psychological matter, material, it can act differently. So it does. That's why it's called the self-willed. So that's why, even though we're in observation, this impression appears and attracts our egotistical consciousness and puts us to sleep. The more you become observant, the more you become um, skilled in observing yourself, the more you'll be able to see how your consciousness is being challenged by your, your egotistical willpower. And you might be able to see how you're still being present, and at the same time, there are, there are egos related to that impression that are ready to take over your three brains. They're right there. They're kind of maybe going in and out. So you can be present and at the same time observe, begin to observe at, low, at deeper levels that activity going on. Now because we have so much ego and because we have so many impressions going on moment by moment, it's difficult to remain present throughout the whole day. It's very difficult. It takes, it's not something that can, can be achieved in one day or one week. But we strive for that. So we can see now, if we, if we reflect again on these words... In a state of alert perception, watchful attention, we can directly verify that the hidden defects flare up spontaneously. In everyday life, the psychological gymnasium through which we can discover... It is precisely everyday life, the psychological gymnasium through which we can discover our defects. So that's how we are discovering. Now there is... Something else, too, when, when you begin to 
observe maybe a little bit deeper, it, be, it can become more difficult to see how the external world is causing your internal world to erupt into these different egotistical states. Because what can happen also is an impression from quite a while ago can still be swirling around in your unconsciousness and still come up and take over your three brains. So when you have that unconscious mental activity, your, that egotistical activity, it causes a chain reaction into another activity, into another activity. And this is what this chain of, of internal um, modified perceptions is what we would call a dream. One thing leading to another fascinating event, which fascinates us about another connected event, which fascinates us about another connected event, which fascinates us about another connected event. And this is how we dream. This is how we daydream. That's why the daydream persists. Because as we are fascinated with one event, that reminds us of another fascinating event. And, th and that this, you can see almost like a chain. That all these different egos are chained together and appear in a series of, of, of memories, which we can call a dream or a daydream. If you begin to observe that, then you begin to connect the dots. Sometimes you have that daydream, and, and then finally something happens that you get out of it. The first thing to do is reflect, retrospect. Okay, I just was thinking about this strange thing, something that happened years ago. Why was I thinking about that? And you have to maybe just sit there for a little bit. And then if you become skillful in that, you start to see... Well, that, I was thinking about that because of this, because of this, because of this, because of this, because of this. And you'll see seven things all connected together. Seven different memories all connected together. And you'll, you may discover that all those seven memories have the same flavor. Same, something similar about them. So by having all of the... If you were to go into the next step, which is comprehension, you, you have a starting point of what that daydream was. So the first, the first thing here is discovery. The second is comprehension. But before we get to that, we need to, to speak about something that goes right along with self-observation, which is inner self-remembering. Really, self-observation and self-remembering are two aspects of the same thing. They need to both be present. But we, we, we look at them separately because it's helpful. It's helpful to do that. So inner self-remembering. So when we say inner self-remembering, we're pointing towards our innermost. We're pointing towards our Divine Mother. We're pointing towards the fact that I am a child of God. I am, a, I am the, the essence of a being. It may be amazing to under, it may be strange to think about it, but you can learn how to self-observe without, without self-remembering. So you can learn how to record and observe things fairly accurately, but without this inner self-remembering, you lose this special shock of the consciousness which really awakens you. So, for example, having a dream that, in, in my own experience, I know I've had a dream where I was observing very well in that dream. I was observing my three brains very well. But I wasn't awakened in that dream. I was still sleeping. Because although I was observing everything, I wasn't remembering myself. I wasn't remembering that I went to, to bed and this must be in the astral world. So you're missing that remembrance. The, the, so when we talk about inner self-remembering, it, it kind of puts the big picture view and kind of connects you with your, with your spirit. And it's that, it's that connection that provides that special shock that can help us overcome this fascinating element. So in the Treaties of Revolutionary Psychology, Samael Anvior writes, innumerable innumerable are the depressed aspirants who, due to lack of psychic powers and inner illumination, have renounced the esoteric work for themselves. 
Few are the ones who know how to take advantage of adversities. During times of rigorous temptations, discouragement and desolation, one must appeal to the intimate remembering of the self. Deep within each one of us is the Aztec Tonatzin, Stella Maris, the Egyptian Isis, God the Mother, waiting for us in order to heal our painful heart. When one gives to oneself the shock of self-remembering, then indeed a marvelous change in the entire work of the body is produced so that the cells receive a different nourishment. So through inner self-remembering, we're, we are performing that aspect of religion, of connecting ourselves to our innermost, to our Divine Mother, moment by moment, and remembering. And sometimes self-observation feels very dry. And that's probably due to a lack of inner self-remembering, because the inner self-remembering really opens up your heart and provides this beauty to life, no matter what situation you're in. It's really what you need to take solace in. You need to take refuge in your innermost. And in you need to take refuge in your Divine Mother. Because you can't do the work without her. So you observe and you remember. And this goes hand in hand with what we call the transformation of impressions. Because here... And this quote, it's talking about someone who's struggling a lot and they can't seem to overcome the adversity. Or we can say they can't overcome the temptation. And, and in reference to this lecture, if you are falling asleep, you're becoming fascinated. If you remember your, your innermost, it provides that shock. It provides that perspective. Suddenly you realize how pale and how... Um, superficial this impression is in front of you. It's just a manifestation of a moment and it helps you overcome that the, the desire of the ego that wants to grab that impression and feed itself. You're able to transform it. Because you see, if you can think of a perspective of being on top of a mountain, you know, or in the superior world and you see these little events occurring on earth that we think are so important, we're so fascinated with, that, that take all of our energy away from us because we think they're so important. And if you were to be go on top of a mountaintop and see how little and how insignificant it is and what the reality is of it, it would be easier to transform that moment. So in the same way, when you are practicing inner self-remembering, you're elevating your consciousness. You're seeing it from a perspective. You're remembering that, that, you, that you are the child of, of an of a inner being. And that gives you a perspective. So as we said before, this, the, the first step is discovery. And we have all these different methods for discovery. We talked about self-observation. We talked about the key of SOL. Talked about we needing to transform the impressions and using inner self-remembering. So we have all of that, but we need to go deeper. We need to put into ourselves a discipline of meditation. It's a, it's a bit of a thorny subject, I think, for some people. I don't know how you can progress in this work without meditating like every day. Maybe you can make some type of progress. But if you're not meditating on a regular basis, I really don't know how you're achieving deep comprehension of yourself. I really don't. So I don't, I don't know how to speak for anybody else. I'll speak for myself in that regard. That without meditation, your life will remain superficial. You'll, you'll work with superficial defects and you'll work with superficial change. With meditation, you'll go deeper. So it's something to, to contemplate. If we are okay with our level of being, then, you know, you don't have to meditate. If you're not okay with your level of being, I recommend meditating more. So comprehension is a, a word that we use quite a bit. 
And I think there's an impression often we give that either you have no comprehension or you have total comprehension. If you need to achieve comprehension of your ego and then eliminate it. This is true. But the ego is something very complicated. We think of it as, as discrete objects within ourselves. But the ego has levels and levels and levels. And it's all interconnected in a very chaotic web. So what we need to comprehend is the way our ego manifested in a particular moment at a particular level. So if we can comprehend a moment of life, by definition, if the ego is active in that moment, then we're comprehending the activity of that ego in that moment. So we have, because we're observing ourselves throughout the day, and we're transforming impressions, we're becoming more skillful in observing. We begin to see when we're behaving in an imbalanced way, when our three brains are working in an unbalanced way, when we're falling asleep. And we now have information that we need to comprehend more. And even if you don't, you can still meditate and review your day. Because that's another piece. So one piece may be sitting down to meditate and realizing that the way you acted today, there was a moment where you really lost your balance. And it may not have been noticeable to anybody else. It may just be internal. It depends. But if you can remember those, those moments, now you can work in retrospect on, on that particular moment. So you have to, again, meditation is a skill, so it's something you practice but you practice at whatever level you're at. And it's very simple. If we were to try to simplify that practice as much as possible, it would be to learn how to relax your body, to close your eyes, and to work with conscious attention and conscious imagination. You're going to struggle with the same exact factors that you'd be struggling with through self-observation during the day, which is falling into fascination, into identification, and into dreams the same exact process. The only difference is now that you're closing your eyes, you're shutting your senses off, and now you're dealing just with the, the, those, that inner chain reaction of inner impressions. So everything that, that we talked about in, self in, the, in, in the discovery aspect can also happen while you're meditating. So closing your eyes, relaxing. We have, different, we have different mantras, breathing exercises that can help generate energy to, to, to sedate the physical body and to provide the energy to see, to, to move our chakras. So we have more of a creative energy flowing, so we have maybe a, a better stability. But all the same things can happen. Images may start flowing into, through your mind, through your perception, in the same way that they would flow if you were just observing life. In the same way as you may become fascinated by one of those. And you may fall into a dream in, in your meditation. Hopefully, without too much time passing, you remember yourself. If you remember yourself, the first thing you should do is reflect, how did I get here? I was just... I was just dreaming about what again? And you may, it, may, it may be difficult, but make the effort. Because if you can make the effort, you can meditate right then and there on something that brought you to fascination. And if there's something that brought you to fascination, if you can discover that, you're that much closer to, to uncovering another little piece of your mind. So you, you reflect, and if you can remember, you become a little more skillful. You do remember what you were just thinking about. And you can remember the, mem the memory before that. And then you find a chain of memories that are all connected. And you can meditate on them. And you can go deeper. That's one way that you can develop comprehension. Typically, I don't know if it's typically, but many times we talk about comprehension, we think of something that's very, an ego that's very difficult and causing a lot of suffering. And we want to work on something that's causing us a lot of suffering, but it's this really, really big thing. And it's, it's difficult to tackle a really huge problem. Maybe it's a 
a problem with someone in your family that's been going on for years, a very difficult like interpersonal relationship. It's causing a lot of suffering. Obviously, we want to work on that. But sometimes when we sit down to meditate on that thing, all these other memories that are, may have nothing to do with it make us fall asleep and go into fascination and all that. Sometimes a student has the resistance to want to, to want to meditate on these little things when really they have this big thing they want to get to. What we have to consider is that there's a relationship between the memories that we don't think have anything to do with this big problem. So we take a completely open and curious perspective. You know, if, if all these memories came up, I don't think that anything to do with this big problem, but you observe them anyway and see them, see it for what, for what they are. Perhaps they are just a spontaneous eruption of the mind, some random chaotic memory. But if you sit with it, comprehend it, if it's a little, if it, maybe it's a superficial, shallow type of memory, so you can transform it after 10 minutes, 15 minutes. That's the way to go through it, because if you have that memory, and something pops into your head, and you try to shove it aside to work on something else in meditation, you're, you're adding forces into your mind. You're creating um, a division. You're forcing yourself to not think about something, and that won't work. So that's, that's the skill, that's part of the skill of meditation, is that Whatever appears to you, must, you, must, you have to accept it, observe it, look at it, at least for some period of time, until it, until it fades away. If you do that, you'll find you've gone to a deeper level of meditation. Because it was that element that kept you from relaxing more. And then at the deeper level of meditation, maybe now you can tackle this bigger thing. So what is that bigger thing? So if you are observing yourself, you may, you're going to start to observe, you know, what is causing me to have these unstable moments? What's causing me to fall asleep? The best way to work on it, as I said before, is not just to say, well, I've had a problem with this family member for so many years, and it's just always causing me problems. I'm going to meditate on it. That will, that will work. That will help. But it's better to say, today I had a, t today I had a, a conversation with this person, and I felt this way. So you actually, you actually make it very practical. You have to work with concrete facts. Not, not an abstract idea of a problem, but this actually happened to me. This is my actual memory. This is what I actually felt. This is what was in my three brains. Then you're, really, you're working with the material. You can actually look into it. It's not an abstract thing where you just meditate on this big vaporous idea of having a problem. You're actually working with how that problem manifested in your life, in reality. And if you continue to do that, if you're working on these manifestations of the problem, you start to understand the big problem. You, you transform that. You comprehend it. I don't, I don't think there's any shortcut that you can comprehend a huge problem like that in one, in one sitting. Not, not in my experience, at least. But so that's how you, that's how you want to work with comprehension, is to take concrete facts of what happened to you, and the only way you're going to have that is if you're observing. If you sit down to meditate, and you're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm, going to, I'm going into meditation, and I've been told that the goal of meditation is to acquire knowledge. So what what do I need to meditate on? If you're meditating on your ego should be like your daily regular thing. You can also meditate on um, you know, different aspects of the, of the teaching or related to your innermost, to different deities, of course. But the, the main thing we're meditating on is our ego until we eliminate it. So as we work we achieve some level of comprehension about some event. Sometimes the question is asked, how do I know I've comprehended something? The answer is that sometimes a bit elusive, but fundamentally you have some more serenity about it. It, it doesn't fascinate you as much. 
Sometimes it's very clear. Sometimes if you're in meditation, you're bringing up this concrete fact, this, this particular event, and you are visualizing it, you're seeing it. You're able to relive it, but not become identified with it. And you see it, you hold it in your attention, but not too tightly, because you, you want it to be fluid and flexible, because that memory may morph and move into something else that, that your mind is bringing it towards. So it may become active. It, you may start seeing something else. And you, you, keep it, you keep it fluid because you want to see, if I'm holding this memory, this experience in my mind, how does it, re it's, and now it's changing into some other memory. Why? I didn't choose that memory. It's going towards that. There's a rela there must be a relationship. And then, and then holding those two things, at some moment you may find some flash, some, some image, some realization, that's the connection. There's some connection. For example, I had a difficult time with, with, with someone in my life, an acquaintance, and just always felt a tension there, always felt even though we had resolved our issues, there was something still really there. And it was really difficult at times to, I felt some kind of pain there. So I was meditating on this particular event in, in the way we interacted with each other. And precisely that was happening. I was holding it in my memory, but I was also relaxing and seeing what else could appear, what else could, could be there. But holding it and having that flexibility. And for some reason, I saw a plate that had the, had, had the image of this person, the plate dropping to the floor and, and shattering. And that was the moment of comprehension for me, in that particular way. And somehow that image spoke to me saying, that relationship has been fractured. There's a, there's, there's a, a damage. There's something deeper than just like intellectually um, getting through your problems. There's something deeper emotionally damaged about that relationship. And that led me to understand what was going on deeper within myself, that there was this fracture, that there was a wound within myself about that that was still hurting. So that was a particular time when I saw that. But you, don't always, you don't, may not always have that type of experience where you, know, where you have that flash of insight right away. You may not. You may complete your meditation. You, you saw the image. You played it through. You sat in it. You marinated in that experience. You never became identified. You sat there for 30, 40, or 60 minutes, and you finish your meditation. You might feel a little bit more, maybe a little bit more at peace with it because you've worked with it a little bit, but there was no profound experience. Sometimes it, it takes time. It's sometimes a little more elusive. Sometimes you have to keep meditating. Sometimes you can practice dream yoga. You can pray, ask for assistance. And sometimes that comprehension arrives in the middle of the day when you least expect it. You, 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 you're just on your way to work or you're on the train and suddenly you understand. Suddenly you thought about it again and it, it, something deep, you, you just understood that moment just deeper. There's a lot more serenity about that. You just see it and it makes sense. So in that case, it wasn't like this, again, it wasn't like the clouds opened up and you profound, and like this thundering voice gave you the knowledge or something like that. Sometimes it happens like that. It happens just very subtly. It might take some perspective, you know, meditating on it multiple times. But even if you, even if you don't think you fully, 100% comprehend it to the, to the absolute depth, if you feel like you've comprehended at least something about it, in my experience, that's enough to ask your Divine Mother to help you eliminate at least that level of the ego. So what Samuel Enviol writes about comprehension is, comprehension is very flexible, which is why it is necessary to delve deeper each time. What we understand in one way today will, be, will, 
we will better understand tomorrow. Considering things from this angle, we can verify for ourselves how useful the diverse circumstances of life are when indeed we use them as a mirror for self-discovery. We would never in any way attempt to say that the dramas, comedies, and tragedies of everyday life are always splendid and perfect. Such a statement would be ludicrous. Nonetheless, however absurd the different situations of existence may appear, they are marvelous as a psychological gymnasium. So comprehension has its levels, and it's something flexible, and it's something that arrives through our discipline of, of meditation. We say that the mind, we say sometimes that, that the intellect is the first level of the mind. So sometimes even having an intellectual understanding of something is more helpful than not. So if you're working with the intellect, you can comprehend something intellectually, but you, might, you need to go much, much deeper to really achieve radical transformation. <coughs> so we talked about discovery, which you can also call observation. Then we talked about comprehension. Sometimes you also call comprehension judgment. But we have to understand that that word for judgment is more of like a divine judgment. And then execution or elimination. Our mind is able to observe itself. It's able to see itself. It's able to understand itself. Because it's, it's like a, the mind is often symbolized as a mirror or a type of reflecting object that um, reflects and refracts and transforms like a, a light. So we want to polish that mirror. We want to learn how to meditate and achieve very good uh, concentration of that light to be able to see what we need to see. But the mind itself cannot destroy the ego. The mind itself never created the ego. What created the ego was our creative energy. It was our sexual energy in different ways and different formations. So we have that creative energy within ourselves and if we don't transform impressions correctly, we'll create more ego. There's no rule that says that because you're, you're in a spiritual doctrine or that you're going to a Gnostic school that you're not creating more egos. You absolutely can be. We hope not. But we have this flow of impressions coming into ourselves and we, so we have a flow or stream of reactions to that and if we don't transform those reactions they're going to pull out of our instinctual center out of our sexual center and create and bind up our consciousness into more aggregates. So having, if we have an impression of life that causes us to get extremely angry, or if we put a lot of attention and a lot of emotion into something, we're going to start to develop an ego related to that. So... You know, for example... We have the World Cup right now going on. Um, or any sports event, right? It's, um, it's amazing how the sports event brings out so much emotion. And it's, a, it's very interesting. For, for myself, I know I, was, I really loved watching some, some sports at a certain point. And I realized I was how much emotion I was putting into it, just watching these games. And I knew intellectually, I knew intellectually that I'm wasting my time, that the, the result of that sport didn't affect me, didn't actually mean anything. It was arbitrary. But at the same time, I was putting my energy into it. And I, I didn't, I, at some point, I didn't want to watch, but at the same time, I did. 
And this is because there was, e- there was egos related to that. Egos that wanted that sensation. Because I was putting so much energy into it, it, was creating so- it created something in me at some point, obviously. When you don't want to do something, but you have the desire to do it anyway, when you have that conflict, obviously there's unconscious will going on. Right? So it's not to say that sports are bad. I mean, sports have all sorts of problems with them in this world, but I'm not trying to make someone into a fanatic either way. You can enjoy life, but obviously there's a lot of things in the world that can really pull our emotion out. And someone who's really a fanatic, right, they feel like if they're not watching the game, then everything's boring because they're all, they have so much ego trapped in that, and they need that to feel anything. So if, they're not, if they don't have that, then they can't feel anything. Someone who likes to ingest a lot of intoxicants, alcohol, or drugs, life is extremely boring unless they have that, that chemical in their body because they have a lot of very, very strong egos related to that. They can't feel anything. Life is boring and miserable There's no, because they're, it's not, they're at, nothing is being activated in themselves. They put the chemical in, they go to the event, and then all these emotions erupt. And they feel like they're alive, but it's a it's it's a um, it's a false type of living, right? So, whatever we spend a lot of time putting our emotional energy into, we have to be very careful. Movies, TV, uh, music, we have to be careful. We have to, you know, these things exist, and there's a certain things that could be, that we can experience in a healthy way, and we can enjoy them. But we have, to, we have to be observant of that. You know, how many hours of the day am I spending, you know, watching, watching a screen or, or doing some event? And is it, is it feeding my sense of self? Am I getting a sense of self out of, this external, out of these external impressions? Am I developing my sense of self out of that? You're probably creating ego, right? So that's something to observe. Anyway, about execution. The mind can't, can't eliminate itself. So just as we use a creative energy to create the ego, the ego is created, in other words, through a mechanical and unconscious activity of the creative energy. And that creative energy is related to our Divine Mother. The elimination of that ego, in our sense, is a conscious activity of that creative energy of our Divine Mother destroying that ego. So we have a beautiful picture here of uh, Durga putting a spear into the, the enemy, to the ego. There's a whole story about that, but I'm not going to get into it. Fundamentally, though, that is, the, that is the, uh, a picture of the Divine Mother killing the ego. So Samuel and Vior writes, the mind itself cannot radically alter any psychological defect. The mind can put a label on any defect, transfer it from one level to another, conceal it from ourselves or others, excuse it, etc., but never absolutely eliminate it. Comprehension is a fundamental part, but it's not everything. Elimination is necessary. And observed defects <clears throat> must be analyzed and understood completely before proceeding to eliminate it. We need a power superior to the mind, a power capable of atomically disintegrating any eye defect which we have previously discovered and judged in depth. Fortunately, such a power lies profoundly latent beyond the body the affections, and the mind. So developing a relationship with your Divine Mother is something very critical and important and necessary, taking refuge in that, having, making that connection, learning how to pray to your Divine Mother. Some people have a, a difficulty in that, and you have to work. If you're not sure exactly what that means, then continue to persist. If we have comprehended our defect, 
we sit down and meditate, or if you're working in alchemy and sexual cooperation with a spouse, then you can connect, unite sexually, and also ask for the elimination of an ego because you're activating a lot of creative energy there. But as a bachelor or as a single person, you can sit down and meditate and supplicate and pray to our Divine Mother to help remove this ego. And if we have comprehended it, and if the karma is paid, then we will, we will be granted that. Again, it's something that is not always directly known when we have really eliminated something. The bottom line is, are we changing as people? Are, are we ch am I changing as a person? We have to develop what's called work memory. This work memory means looking back at our past and seeing how we have changed. Looking at our past and seeing ourselves almost as a different person in the past. And how, and how we have changed little by little. And that's how we know we're achieving that elimination to some degree. Again, you may also have some type of experience. And that experience often is looking very similar to the picture here. It can look very similar to that. You can take whatever manifestation the Divine Mother wishes. But sometimes in the internal worlds, our egos that have been comprehended look like small children. Little devious small children. And the Divine Mother will do the deed to eliminate that ego and liberate the consciousness, the essence. There have been times, for example, I'm, I'm looking to eliminate something, working on elimination, and I find a deep emotional catharsis occurring, meaning feeling at a very deep level how that ego was causing suffering for myself and how that ego was causing suffering for all these other people in my life. And that emotional center really lighting up and maybe tears, but a levity behind it, a, a, a luminous type of experience of being free of that, of having the ability now to be one level more free of that. So sometimes that's related to that elimination. You're being granted another level of serenity related to that event. You have serenity about it. You have, you're, you're, you're conscious about it, you've comprehended it, and you've eliminated it. Now you may be in the internal worlds and you may see your Divine Mother working to eliminate your ego. For example, you may see, uh, sometimes we talk about this being execution, right? So it may actually be like a judge. And you may be next to a particular aggregate represented in that astral world. And this actual type of trial and judgment and execution occurring. That can also happen. So, um, this slide here at the end is the exact same one from a previous lecture, but to sum up the three steps is discovery, judgment or comprehension, and execution. This is our method. This is our method of seeing ourselves and working on ourselves to awaken our consciousness, to eliminate our ego. However, we need to actually do it. We cannot just sit by idly. Nothing will happen if we sit by idly. In uh, the book of James, he, it's written, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. 
For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So we can see, and this quote just reminds me of a man beholding his natural face in a glass, seeing himself in his own psychological mirror, and doing something about it. If you have a prescription for medicine, but you never actually take the medicine, the medicine doesn't do anything. The teachings is that prescription. But you actually have to fill out the prescription and, and, and take the medicine. And the medicine is the work. I uh, once, I was talking to a, a gentleman who had spent many years in this tradition. Uh, his, his mom, his birth mother was in this tradition. So he was born and he's, he was older than me. So his whole life was in this tradition. And it, I, I was talking to him and he was giving me the impression that he really was thinking that he was awakened and that he's really done a lot of work on himself. And I said, okay, nice, nice to see you. And he had to go on his way. And then he came back a few minutes later, knocked on the door and said, oh, I forgot my cell phone. He walked in and got his cell phone. But this person really thought that he was, he really thought he had done all the work he needed to do. And I, before he had left, I directly asked him, do you think you're awake? Do you think you have any more work? And he really gave this impression that he was kind of done. And you know, we all can have our own perspective on something. But it doesn't matter how many years you're in this tradition. It really it doesn't. It's whether you're doing the work or not. That's, that's what matters, is, is, the, is the results. And just because you might have a very... Um, vast intellectual culture about something doesn't mean that you've done the work. So that's, that's really, that's the fundamental thing. So with that, do we have any questions? Good question. So the question is about comprehension and a deep significance. And, and, and I think in the case that I gave, that was precisely it, where I saw this image of this plate shattering. Was, that was something that just was new to me. Like, I don't know where that came from. I mean, obviously, it came from my conscious imagination, from my innermost, delivering us this impression, this uh, symbol. And that was deeply significant to me. Here's the thing, though. Yes, it's, something, it's going to be something new, but it doesn't have to be a, an image that you see in meditation. It can be just this abstract, it can just be a knowledge that just is appearing in your head, like you just, something clicks. Or, emotion. or emotion. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be a profound clairvoyant vision or something like that. I think that's, that's what I was trying to get at. But something has to, like I said, go deeper. It has to, has to click. At some level, like I said, again, there has to be a, I think, a understanding that you're not going to necessarily understand the whole ego. You might get a significance and work at that level and then go to a deeper level. Because that's what that one quote says here. What we understand in one day today, we'll understand better tomorrow. I think you can develop a deep significance and, then to, and work on that, and then you can develop even a deeper significance. Level of the work, or is this something in the beginning? So it's written 
about working two months on a specific defect. I think you need to understand that both in a literal and a symbolic sense at the same time, that you definitely can work two months on every defect, but you may need to work more, or you, you could, if some other, the, the problem is, if you're working two months on a particular defect, and all this other stuff is going on that's really showing you that there's something else much more important to work on right now, you might need to work on another defect right then. But I think as, as a guideline, if you were to see a particular trait or characteristic in yourself, and to work on it for two months, that's a serious work. You know, you're going you're gonna to figure out something about yourself. And then you may move on to another defect, and a later period may move back to a deeper level of that particular defect again, because you see it again in a whole new way. You didn't have the, even the perception to see how subtle uh, that defect was even deeper. So the work is, is, that's what's strange about the work, is it has a method and an order to it, and at the same time, it's very, it has to be very flexible and observant. Because if you're so identified with working on a particular defect, you may put the blinders on and see other stuff that you need, really need to see. Because we have our self-concept of what the defect is. That's our intellect labeling the defect. But what if the intellect is really excluding all this information that we need to put into this, under, into this comprehension? So you have to be very fluid. That, that's, that's my experience, at least. So why do we say that there's only 3% free consciousness? Because of the three primary forces. We have the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, or uh, Keter, Hokuma, and Bina, these, the, or the Trimurti. The three primary seed elements of ourselves. What's really being um, shown there is that we have, uh, we say about 3%. That 3% really represents those three primary factors, the last bit of our free consciousness before it gets totally swallowed up. So long as we have the, those three factors, we can work on our ego. Um, whether we're someone that really has a little bit more or a little bit less, it depends on the person. So, but that's why we say 3%. It's, really, it's literal, again, it's literal, but it's Kabbalistic at the same time. It's, it's about 3%. But... When we do the work, it starts to, it starts to develop. I mean, that 3% becomes greater. But only we know inside what that percentage is. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.